You are listening to the Nature's Premier Podcast, Episode 58, honoring three women in conservation. Here on the Nature's Premier Podcast, we talk about everything from bees to babies and sustainable living. Join us while we talk about natural parenting and different ways to live a more sustainable lifestyle for ourselves and our future generations to come. Now let's begin. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to another episode here on the Nature's Premier Podcast. I am your host, Brooke Nichols, and I am beyond blessed to be here with you all today. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode. Today's episode is sponsored by Nature's Premier Diaper Service, New York's premier cloth and compostable diaper service, providing families with a healthier way to diaper their babies. Check them out at www.naturespremier.com and subscribe to their email list to get five tips on how you can green your nursery today. Now on to the show. The definition of conservation is the preservation, protection, or restoration of the natural environment, natural ecosystems, vegetation, and wildlife. Now, that might sound a little vague. You know, natural ecosystems could mean so many different things. Wildlife can mean just a ton of different animals, vegetation, environment, and so forth. But there really are core things that environmentalists and conservationists have impacted that have made a difference in our lives today. When I do a quick Google search, we get a whole ton of very common conservationists that many people know of. We get Theodore Roosevelt, we get Jimmy Carter, Lewis and Clark, Ernest Hemingway, Aldo Leopold, Charles Darwin. I mean, the list really does go on. Steve Irwin, we get Jack Hanna. I mean, there's so many different conservationists that come to mind when you think of conservation. But what a lot of people don't realize is there's a lot of females that have made a gigantic impact in the conservation and the naturalist world. You know, we hear of those like Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, Rachel Carson, um, Dr. Mary Gildakis, who is lesser known, but she's also done a lot of things. um, And she's more known than the people I'm going to talk about today. And, you know, it's interesting that in the last hundred years, There have been so many names to have, you know, made an impact, but very few of them get the accreditation like the men do in the conservation field. Now, also because we live in a different time and, you know, it's just things that people don't talk about. But I think that people need to talk more about, you know, the superheroes, truthfully, of our time. I mean, conservationists, environmentalists, I mean, these are people that are making a difference. You know, I know people like to, you know, talk about different movie stars and, you know, music and all this other good stuff. And that's fine as a source of entertainment. But when it comes to, like, the planet and people making a difference, I think these are the people that should be put on a, on a pedestal, truthfully, in my personal opinion. Um, the people that I'm going to talk about today, like I mentioned, Dr. Jane Goodall, I mean, those are people that are really making a difference and changing the lives of so many people people, of so many animals, and the environment that we live in. So today I just wanted to take a couple minutes and talk about a few different women, three to be exact, that have made a huge impact on the community around them and whose legend, or legacy rather, live on. The first woman that I'm going to highlight on today's Women in Conservation episode is going to be Dr. Lori L. Marker. Dr. Lori Marker is the founder and executive director of the Cheetah Conservation Fund. Having worked with Cheetahs since 1974, Lori set up the not-for-profit fund in 1990 and moved to Namibia to develop a permanent conservation research center for the wild cheetah. Dr. Marker helped develop the U.S. and international captive program, establishing the most successful captive cheetah breeding program in North America during her 16 years between 1974 and 1988 at Oregon's Wildlife Safari in the United States. Lori first came to Namibia in 1977 when she brought a captive-born, hand-raised cheetah to Namibia to determine if a cheetah must be taught to hunt or if the process was fully instinctual. This was the first of its kind research to better understand if there was a chance for captive-born cheetahs to be reintroduced into the wild. Dr. Marker learned about the conflict between livestock farmers and cheetahs in Namibia, discovering that wild cheetahs needed help. For the next 10 years, she continued traveling to Africa to learn more about the wild cheetah's problems and what could be done to assist wild populations. In the early 1980s, with collaborators at the National Zoo and National Cancer Institute in the United States, Dr. Marker helped identify the cheetah's lack of genetic variation, thus causing the species greater problems for survival. 
In 1988, in collaboration with these two institutions, she became the executive director of the Center for New Opportunities in Animal Health Sciences, based at Smithsonian Institution's National Zoo. She continues to serve as a NOAHS Research Fellow. In 1988, she developed the International Cheetah Stud Book, a registry of captive cheetah worldwide, and is the International Stud Book Keeper. In 1996, she was made a Vice Chair of the World Conservation Union's Species Survival Commission's Cat Specialist Group and now serves as a member on the Core Management Group. Among numerous awards, Dr. Marker has been recognized as one of the Time Magazine's Heroes for the Planet in 2000 and received the Zoological Society of San Diego's Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. More recently, she was awarded the 2010 Tyler Prize for Environmental Achievement and was a finalist for the BBC World Challenge. In Namibia, her home base, she received the Winnie Oak Rotary Club's Paul Harris Fellowship in 2001 and in 2002 received a special award from the Sandveld Conservancy, signifying Namibia's farming community's public acknowledgement of Dr. Marker and CCF's contributions. In 2002, Lori received her doctorate from Oxford University in England. So obviously, Dr. Lori L. Marker is a total rock star. I mean, she has done so much for the cheetah population. And one thing that I wanted to mention that a lot of people don't know, and what I actually just found out in my research, was that we have lost over 90% of the world's cheetah population in the last 100 years. So the work of Dr. Lori Marker is absolutely phenomenal and it's much needed. And I am of the thought that they might not even be here if it wasn't her determination and her passion to bring up their numbers. Just to mention some of the threats to the cheetah's survival are human wildlife conflicts, habitat loss, and the illegal pet trade. And I just have to say about the human wildlife conflicts, you know, a lot of times there are major issues that affect so many different you know areas right like we have deforestation that affects so many at lives like so many lives of animals of lives of humans you know deforestation it kills the planet and it kills these homes of these animals and then what happens is they wander into farms and they're killing livestock and the farmers shoot the cheetah you know this is like a horrible you know cycle that keeps going on and this is why we always talk about learning more about deforestation because it really is just destroying the world, the populations of these beautiful animals, and it's an absolute um, tragedy. However, with people like Dr. Lori L. Marker, who is doing an awesome job and who started the Cheetah Conservation Fund, do check them out at cheetah.org. Um, I was looking up at their site, and it's just amazing all the work that she gets done and all the work that she has done. And that is why I chose her as one of the women we wanted to talk to today about women in conservation. The next woman that I wanted to highlight on today's episode was Margie Richard. Now, this is actually a very popular case that happened in the past, but of course, with time, the passage of time, people do forget about these issues. But Margie is actually a total rock star as well. I mean, she's incredible. And I'm going to share some of her story with you. We got some of this information from PRI.org and also from MotherNatureNetwork.com. Do check them out. They're a fantastic site. Margie Richard is the first African-American to win the esteemed Goldman Environmental Prize. She earned it through a long and very difficult but brilliantly won battle with Shell, the oil company, over a refinery whose emissions were slowly killing her community and members in Old Diamond, a neighborhood in Norco, Louisiana. Norco is a town of around 3,000 residents on the Mississippi River, about 20 miles upriver from New Orleans. It gets its name from the New Orleans Refining Company, which operated an oil refinery there built by Shell in 1916. The problems in Norco started in the 1950s when Shell built a chemical plant in a black neighborhood called Diamond where Richard is from. Growing up, she remembers smelling foul, bleach-like odors from the plant. Then, in the summer of 1973, a teenager named Leroy Jones was mowing the lawn of an elderly woman when he stopped for a moment. A pipeline was leaking not too far away. When he restarted the mower, it sparked an explosion. Helen Washington, the resident of the house, was killed. Jones tried to run away, his clothes on fire, and he died a few days later. Richard saw the aftermath firsthand, and the memory stuck with her ever since. That experience was a turning point for Richards, who began to document the health problems of people in the neighborhood. Then, tragedy struck closer to home. Her sister died at the age of 43 of a rare inflammatory disease called sarcoidosis. 
While scientists disagree over what causes a disease, some think that chemical exposure can trigger it. Richard suspects that was the case. Another explosion rocked the town in 1988, this time at the Shell Oil Refinery. Seven workers died and the blast was felt as far away as New Orleans. Richard went on a mission to force Shell to relocate residents away from both plants. She worked with the environmental group, the Louisiana Bucket Brigade, to conduct air quality tests. The device the group uses, a five gallon bucket, was originally pioneered by Erin Brockovich's lawyer. The tests paid off. The group was able to detect chemicals in the air that Shell had failed to report to the state's environmental agency. The media began to pay close attention to the case. As the controversy grew, Richard was even invited to speak before the United Nations in 1999. She came to armed with a powerful story and an air sample from Norco. After confronting a high-ranking Shell official who refused to smell this bag of polluted air that she brought to the United Nations, a few weeks later, the company changed its position. Shell offered to buy out the homes of people who lived near the plant. The minimum offer was $80,000, and more than 300 families took it, including Richards. The company said the decision to buy out the homes was part of the long-term strategy to create a green belt around the plant and was not related to health concerns. I mean, I'm sure it was. <laughs> I'm sure it was. Thanks to Richard's incredible advocacy and savvy acts of political theater, including broadcasting live feeds of the refinery releasing petrochemical byproducts into the environment, Shell Chemical agreed in 2000 to reduce its toxic emissions by 30%, contribute $5 million to a community development fund, and voluntarily finance the relocation of Old Diamond residents away from the refinery, again, by buying the 225 lots at the minimum price of $80,000 per lot. Richard's work is more than just environmental justice, but social justice as well. According to a Goldman Prize, People of color are more likely than whites to live near areas polluted by industrial plants. 71% of African Americans live in counties that don't meet federal air pollution standards. As a consequence, studies show that black people suffer disproportionately from respiratory and other environmental ailments. Community protests against these conditions produce a uniquely American brand of activism that is equal parts civil rights and environmentalism. Richard stood at the forefront of this important social justice movement. She is an absolute rock star, and that is why we wanted to highlight her today. Before I move on to the third woman in conservation that we are highlighting on today's episode, which I'm thinking is probably going to be a trend, truthfully, I think I'm going to shout out a lot of these women that don't get the proper notoriety, or at least not as frequently as they should. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about Margie Richards' just bout with Shell. I mean you have to look into her story. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm leaving out a ton of details to make this episode shorter and just to kind of give a quick highlight. But really, like, the whole story is insane. I mean, these huge conglomerate companies that literally don't have a pulse. I mean, their wallet is their pulse, truthfully. We talk about that all the time on the podcast. You know, you got to hit these people in the wallet to make them move. But the way that she handled it, I mean, the antics that went into exposing Shell and exposing what they were doing, and then for them not to even, like, acknowledge that there was a health issue, that they were just trying to build a green belt, to just show you how, you know, like, arrogant these companies are. But the amount of hoops that this woman had to jump through to make the impact that she did, which is absolutely amazing to me. And that should show you right there that you are never too small to make a difference. You are never too small to have an impact on the community and the people around you. She was obviously moved by passion, by dedication, and just by the right of knowing that what was happening was wrong. And she got this company to move a different way that they certainly would not have moved had she not blown the freaking horn on what they were doing. I mean, to have a gigantic factory outside of a community where there's families, where there's people, older people, like where everyone's just trying to live and to have all these accidents happen and no one say anything. I mean, that shows you that there's still people out there who give a damn, who want to make a difference. And her story, if nothing else, should motivate you on what can happen when one person takes it to the top really fights these companies and hits them where it hurts the most, their wallet, their ego, and the media surrounding their image. Last but not least, woman in conservation that we are highlighting on today's episode is going to be Gloria Hollister Annabel. She was an explorer, a scientist, and a conservationist 
who set a woman's world record for ocean descent in the bathysphere in 1931. Miss Hollister, as she was known during most of her scientific career, became a celebrity in the 1930s, a time when only a handful of women earned headlines for their feats in a man's world of discovery. Miss Hollister was a longtime associate of Dr. William Beebe, the oceanographer. She was his chief assistant on many of his voyages of exploration in the late 1920s and 1930s, and she served with other expeditions of the New York Zoological Society, of which she was a fellow. In 1920, Gloria Hollister enrolled at Connecticut College for Women, taking her childhood love and applying it toward a major in zoology under the tutelage of Pauline Dedrier. She graduated in 1924. During her college career, she served as class president and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. She was also heavily involved in sports and played varsity basketball and soccer, was a high jumper and a discus thrower on the track team, and was chosen in 1920 as a member of the All-American Girls Hockey Team. In fall 1924, she continued her studies in zoology at Columbia University under Florence Lothar and William K. Gregory. She received her MS in zoology from Columbia in spring 1925. Following her graduate studies, she served as research assistant to the renowned biologist Alexis Carroll at the Rockefeller Institute, working in his laboratory on cancer research. In early 1928, weary of spending long hours inside of a laboratory and yearning for an opportunity to return to the outdoors, Gloria Hollister applied for a position with the famed naturalist William Beebe in his Department of Tropical Research at the New York Zoology Society. Beebe was seeking a professional naturalist skilled at dissecting to join his staff for an upcoming oceanographic expedition to Bermuda. Dismissing concerns from some about the capabilities of women scientists, Beebe hired Hollister and several other women, including Jocelyn Crane, to join the team. During the DTR's Bermuda Oceanographic Expeditions of 1928 to 1940, Hollister honed her expertise in fish, osteology, and continued this work in the DTR's West Indies Oceanographic Expedition, 1932 to 1933, and the Pearl Islands Oceanographic Expedition in 1934. In Bermuda, Hollister set the world record for the deepest dive undertaken by a woman. She performed the dive in the bathysphere, a large steel submersible in which Beatty and the bathysphere engineer Otis Barton undertook deep sea explorations throughout the early 1930s. On June 11, 1930, her 30th birthday, she went down 410 feet for the woman's descent record. In 1934, she would nearly triple her own record by descending to 1,208 feet. The dives were not simple feats for Hollister, but as for Bebe, a chance to explore the deep sea world. In 1936, having served as a part of the oceanographic expeditions under Bebe's leadership, Hollister undertook her own expedition for the DTR, leading an exploration party 200 miles through the jungles of Guana, then known as British Guana, to the Catier Plateau. Using a light plane on the trip, she recorded 43 waterfalls, many of which had not been observed by anyone outside of local people. Gloria Hollister lectured extensively on behalf of the DTR about the team's expeditions and scientific findings. Filled with her personal experiences and photographs, as well as scientific information, her lectures were very popular, and through them, she raised two-thirds of the cost to the Guana expedition she led. Her expeditions, the publicity surrounding them, and her scientific publications brought her recognition. She was a member of the Society of Women Geographers and later received their Outstanding Achievement Award. In addition to her mentors, Carrick and Bebe, she counted among her friends Dan Beard, Lincoln Ellsworth, Amelia Earhart, Raymond Dittmers, Roy Chapman Andrews, and a few more. In 1952, having settled in Connecticut with her husband, Gloria, now Annabel, became enchanted with the Manus River Gorge and subsequently concerned about its preservation. On December 12, 1953, the Annabels, along with Edgar Egerton, James Todd, and Robert Hammerschlag, to name a few, founded the Manus River Gorge Conservation Committee. The committee became a full member of the Nature Conservancy in 1954, and the Manus River Gorge became the Nature Conservancy's pioneer land project. In the summer of 1954, Gloria Annabelle undertook a major effort to equate local associations with the gorge and the threats it faced from subdivision. She took more than 400 visitors through the gorge that year, and support for its preservation grew. She served as a committee secretary chairman and later chairman emeritus. 
1964, the gorge became the country's first natural history landmark to be registered by the Department of the Interior. The preserve, originally 60 acres, now includes 770 acres with another 176 acres under conservation easements. Like the other women mentioned in today's episode, Gloria was a true conservationist and she did a lot for the women of her time, especially getting acknowledged as being a woman in science when we only acknowledge men in that field at that time. Gloria had a very long life and helped many different animals, people, and the environment during it. On February 19th, 1988, Gloria passed away at the age of 87. Conservation is again, preservation, protection, or restoration of the natural environment, natural ecosystems, vegetation, and wildlife. Today we heard of such female conservationists like Dr. Lori L. Marker, who made a huge dent on the conservation efforts for the cheetah population and continues to do so to this day. We talked about such female conservationists such as Margie Richard, who blew the horn and blew the whistle on Shell who was poisoning her community, and it was in turn hurting people, killing people. And she made them accountable for their actions, which in turn helped their community to get up and move so they can move into a safer location on Shell's Dime. And we just summed up the life of Gloria Hollister very briefly. She has done so much for the science community, for the women involved in her field, and also for the environment and the discovery of many different things we didn't even know about. So these women are just a few of the conservationists that we wanted to highlight. We will be having another series on conservation, women in conservation. And of course, we will also hi highlight, you know, men and everybody in conservation. But we just wanted to take this time to highlight the women who you may not have heard of. And when you do look these people up, like, you'll find so much information. There's lifelong information on these people. I mean, obviously, the internet is fantastic. But those aren't the things we're reading about or most people are reading about and we really need to like teach our daughters teach our sons about these people because they are people that made such an impact on their community on their environment and these are the people that we should be paying homage to so thank you guys so much for listening to this episode i really appreciate your support if you haven't already please make sure to rate and subscribe to this podcast it really helps us get this message out to more families and get this message out to more people who may not have heard of this information i know there were two people on this list that i haven't heard of up until recently when i started to research and that was why i jumped into having them be on our first episode for women in conservation. So this is a fun episode to do and we will definitely be doing more of these soon. And thank you all so much again for your patronage and support. If you ever have any questions or want to collab on a future episode of the podcast, please feel free to reach out to us at speaking at naturespremier.com. Even if you just have some comments or if you want to join our community, check us out on our growing page on Facebook at the Nature's Premier Podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning in and until next week, we hope you have a wonderful stress-free week ahead. Take care, friends.